In her book, Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers, Mary Roach wrote, The way I see it, being dead is not terribly far off from being on a cruise ship. Most of your time is spent lying on your back. The brain is shut down. The flesh begins to soften. Nothing much new happens, and nothing is expected of you. Welcome to the A&P Professor, a few minutes to focus on teaching human anatomy and physiology with host Kevin Patton. This is a special episode featuring classic segments on using human remains in teaching and learning. This episode is the second of a series of specials in which I've gone back to the secret underground vault containing segments from all the past episodes. I comb through my library of segments and draw together those with a recurring theme that seems to resonate with all of you. Then I mash them together into a single episode. So you can hear them again, back to back. Or perhaps you're hearing one or more of them for the first time. Either way, it's a chance to reflect on ideas that may help us evolve as A&P teachers. In this episode, we revisit some ideas related to the use of human remains and reproductions of human remains in teaching anatomy. In the first segment, we go back to episode 29, which we called The Silent Teacher, and that featured a conversation with A&P professor and speaker Aaron Fried about human body donors. There's also a segment called Situs and Versus, and that was from a recent episode, episode 43, that was all about anatomic variation. And this segment involves an experience that I had with a human body donor. And I have another segment that is several recommendations from the book club that are mushed together. One of them is mentioned by Aaron Fried in that first segment, and one of them is mentioned in the preview to episode 44. By the way, once we get back to the regular episodes, that is, after this series of special episodes is over, new entries into the A&P Professor Book Club are always introduced in the preview episode, not the regular episode. So if you skip the previews, well, you're missing a lot of content. I'm just saying. Also in this special episode will be another segment that involves a second conversation with Aaron Fried, and that one was called The Nazi Anatomists. Now, something I didn't mention about my conversations with Aaron Fried the first time these aired in episodes 29 and 30 is that the original idea was to have one long conversation, and we did. (laughs) But something happened. I don't know. Maybe I simply forgot to press the record button. But <laughs> whatever happened, none of that long conversation was recorded. None of it. Which was too bad because it was a great conversation. And Aaron, being the nice guy that he is, <laughs> he agreed to record again on a different day. And we got to thinking that there was a natural break in the two main themes that he was talking about. So we decided to break it into two segments, each to air in a different consecutive episode. And I think that worked out great. And I think the fact that we got to rehearse the whole thing once, yes, (laughs) I'll call that first one a rehearsal, and that way I can avoid calling it a screw-up on my part. Anyway, I think we ended up with a better conversation the second time. You know, sort of like how in your course that Second time you lecture on a new topic, it always goes much more smoothly than that first time you did it. Okay, enough of the backstory. Let's get moving. This podcast is sponsored by HAPS, the Human Anatomy and Physiology Society, promoting excellence in the teaching of human anatomy and physiology for over 30 years. Go visit HAPS at theapprofessor.org slash HAPS. That's H-A-P-S. 
Today's featured segment is a chat with my friend Aaron Fried. I know Aaron from the Human Anatomy and Physiology Society, or HAPS. He's an assistant professor of anatomy and physiology at Mohawk Valley Community College in upstate New York. Besides a lot of experience teaching AMP, instructional design, and teaching methods, Aaron is dedicated to the use of human donor dissection and human and animal tissues for learning and instruction, and is a national speaker on the history of body donation specializing in the history of body use in Nazi Germany. Well, hi, Aaron. It's really great to talk to you again, and uh, welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to be here. Well, I think we need to just jump right into it. This is going to be a two-part conversation, so we're going to do the first part in this episode, and uh, then in the next episode, we're going to do the second part. And the two parts do hang together, but you'll need to listen to both parts to see how they hang together and where we're going to go with this. You know, at some level, I think we all know that cadavers used in anatomy education are the remains of real people with real lives and real families and friends. But I wonder how much of that really sinks in. I know you've given a lot of thought to that and even speak about it to anatomy educators. What is it you feel that's important to share about using human remains in teaching anatomy? Well, so uh, that's a question I always love to answer. And, you know, the other thing, I always like to catch people in a trap and not tell them beforehand, but I actually don't prefer the use of the word cadaver. We try to work with our students and have them describe um, them as human donors. And I'll circle around to that in a little bit. I've been lucky enough when I took anatomy as an undergraduate, um, worked in a program where we had one human donor that we worked with, um, it was as a prosection. And then uh, I've been at Mohawk Valley Community College for the last nine or 10 years. And we are gifted to have this program at our school where we get every year um, four or five donors that we get some of our best students to come back from the year and they go through a course with us where they do the dissection. And then we have those donors as pro sections to work with our uh, anatomy one and anatomy two students over the course of a year. We have kind of this program where we call those our silent teachers. And that's actually something that originates well before my time here. HAPS member retired from our campus, Bill Parati, uh, actually brought this into the program when they started this. Uh, the idea that the, the, these are individuals who donated their body after they died in order for us and for our students, uh, especially we have a lot of students who are going to go on and become you know, health professionals, nurses, radiology technicians, respiratory therapists, to learn from and to be able to you know, continue this knowledge that we gain in anatomical sciences as a foundation for health uh, professions. And so we actually go so far as to give our students the first names of our donors uh, to kind of show that there's kind of a dignity and a respect to what we're doing and that it's important for us to both honor and respect as we learn um, from their tissues. Uh, and, you know, the, the story goes from when the, the first year they had the donors, another uh, former HAPS member, um, Sam Drogo, who passed away a few years ago. The first year that we had uh, donors in our lab, one of the donors was his father's roommate in palliative care. And then in the fall of last year, actually had a student who was a uh, CNA in a palliative care facility who took care of one of our donors at end of life. I mean, it, it really hits home that there's a, a huge human connection when you can look around the room and say to the other students, this is an important gift that, you know, that someone gave us after they were done with their body so that we could use it to learn. Yeah. I, uh, I kind of had an experience like that myself and I, uh, in that I've had family members, uh, including my own father, when they passed away, they left their bodies for medical education. Actually, at the university where I was teaching, I was teaching in the physiology department at the time, so I was never in the lab. But 
you know, I thought about them being over there and being used that way. And even though I look, looking back, I feel like, you know, I've always tried to be respectful of the lives of the people who uh, made these donations so that we can use them in teaching and learning. It wasn't until I had family members that I knew were over there in the lab and I knew were being used this way um, that it, that that idea really deepened in me. And I, I really can't not think of that when I'm dealing with human tissues. Now, you have the opportunity to use, well, I almost said cadavers. Yeah, it's hard, you know, and we, we struggle all the time. I mean, we say it and, you know, as, as a little bit of background, um, and I know this is going to be the second part of our talk, but so I do research into Nazi anatomists and as I was talking to a specialist in the field, uh, Sabine Hildebrandt, who's actually a, um, from Germany, she said the reason that she doesn't prefer the use of cadavers is because uh, the way that they would view that in Germany is that cadaver is a term that um, is like refuse. It's like trash. It's like something you throw away. And so I actually went after that interview and I um, looked up the etymology of cadaver. And I think you know, this is always disputed and I'm not a linguist, but I think you, you go, um, you go far enough back and, you know, now we say cadaver is some, from some tra translation, like from the remains, but I actually think it means something more like, um, from the earth or, you know, you know, something a lot more like that, um, from the trash kind of, um, connotation. So it's tough, but that's why we try to, and I'm actually shocked this year with our students that, um, because they've never really had the use of that term cadaver so much, they, they use the word donor almost effortlessly. So it's nice to be able to see that once we kind of put that emphasis on it, it's easier for the next generation to pick that stuff up. I, I think that's a great approach. And I mean, you're right. It is kind of hard to shed what we're used to. But on the other hand, I, you know, it really is important how we say things. I mean, that really does imply some thoughts and feelings and attitudes when we do that. So I'm, I'm all for it. So I'm going to really focus on using the term human donors. And, and you have human donors, but we don't have human donors in our school, except I guess we do. I think we still do have uh, one human skeleton and, uh, you know, actual skeletal material. And, and I think we, we have some, uh, uh, skulls, natural skulls. Mo most of that has been replaced over the years with plastic reproductions. And, and even in using those plastic reproductions, um, you know, it's a replica and I use models and so on, but those are all based on cadavers. And much of the art we use in our lab charts and our textbooks and anatomy atlases, those are drawn directly from, or at least indirectly from the remains of real people. Aaron, do you see any issues regarding what we ought to think about as we use these sort of derivative materials? I, you know, this is one of those things where sometimes I always wonder if I'm searching for ethical issues because I've been studying the, uh, the Nazis. So I should describe my desk before I answer this question, because uh, as I look straight in front of me, Halloween is like the best um, a holiday for anatomists because I can go anywhere and look at what would be a great anatomical specimen for me to put on my desk. And so like I have a fake uh, skeleton hand on my uh, card, my index card holder. I have a skull that I picked up. Um, I think I was with my wife at Michael's. And the reason I grabbed this skull is because it is uh, like suture to suture, almost a perfect replica of an actual skull and it's labeled well and, you know, you're right. These are things that come from, you know, they're, they're derivative at some point of an actual individual. And um, so sometimes I'm, I'm always wondering, uh, especially uh, when I travel, I try to go a lot to anatomical museums or you'll run into oddity shops where people are actually selling human tissues. I was actually in Baltimore this summer and I bought um, a student box of brain tissue from an oddity shop that, you know, in a way I felt like I was rescuing because I was at least able to bring back into education so that we could use these slides. But I mean, these are human pieces of tissue, real human beings that, um, 
in that slide box, in that, that um, brain slide box, that, you know, you, I always wonder, did this person intend for that to be the case? I see images of like a skeleton posed in a certain way, a real human skeleton posed in a certain way. And I think of, you know, there's some dubious history to where specimens came from at certain times in our past. Um, with skeletons, you said you have a human skeleton in your lab and we have as many human um, tissues in our labs as possible. We have plastinations. But, you know, with skeletons, there was a whole period of time where uh, in India, there was a bone trade where people were being murdered so that they could clean the bones and sell the bones. And it's likely that in collections all across the United States, there are individuals who potentially were part of that kind of unsavory bone trade. With plastinations, for example, um, we actually just got some new plastinations in our lab, and they're wonderful because it's real human tissue. You can see the real variation. You can see the real contours, the real lines. But um, I, it also makes me think of like the body worlds and bodies, the exhibition, and all of those plastination exhibits. And um, there's lots of anatomical drawings that have been done historically. Um, I think originally a lot of artists who were drawing anatomy, uh, trying to be anatomists, were drawing art to kind of get away with doing anatomy. And so that's led to this kind of, you know, looking at the human body and the form as this beautiful artistic representation. So you go to this plastination exhibit and you're looking at real human bodies, but we see it as this breathtaking artwork. And we don't think about, well, hey, where did those bodies come from? Is this an actual individual who consented that this is what their tissue should live on for? Yeah, you know, is this, does creating an artistic representation kind of degrade the humanity of the subject. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm always, I'm kind of constantly thinking of that. And I, um, over the summer, one of my, this is, I always uh, think it's funny to tell people that my for fun reading, I read about anatomy, but I read uh, a biography of um, Gray's Anatomy, which is a historical anatomical atlas. It was interesting and for a couple different reasons. Um, one, uh, you know, it was common at the time for so the, the Gray's Anatomy, the anatomist is the story of the two Henrys that were, invo were involved in creating the first Gray's Anatomy, Henry Gray, who we actually don't know much about because he didn't keep a diary, and Henry Van Dyke, who was the, the artist who kept detailed diaries, and that's really what the story told, but the uh, author, Bill Hayes, actually went to... Um, University of San Francisco Medical School and took several um, dissection courses. And one of the things that's interesting is to think about someone who's not necessarily an anatomist going through this experience and one, seeing the um, amount of information he learned from actually doing dissections, which is one importance, but two, the reverie that you get from working with a human, realizing it's a human. And so that's, you know, it's kind of a constant. Um, thing in my head as I look at specimens. So even as I have, you know, I'm describing this skull on my desk that I'm looking at. So that, you know, it's, it's clearly modeled after a real human skull. And so this is not a human, it's not an actual human skull, but does that, is this an artistic statement that in, inspires people to think that this is a macabre odd, oddity that I should, you know, strive to, to put on my desk or, or have and, and cherish. And, um, you know, it's, it creates a, an ethical uh, question, and I won't say dilemma, but question about what the effect of the you know these drawings have outside of learning. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really good point about you know this dilemma that we have, and and I, I feel that because you know in a way there are these cultural. Um, things that we do, not just with Halloween, but there's, you know, the Day of the Dead and uh, various other ways that we use representations of, you know, human remains that, you know, we can't dismiss that, you know, these cultural traditions and so on. But on the other hand, I think when we put on the hat of an anatomy teacher and the hat of an anatomist, then maybe you know, we have some extra responsibility to think harder about that, and especially in the way that we relate that. So I know that in my my own courses that um, the rule in in my lab and in my class, and, and that was 
we don't put silly hats on the skulls and take selfies with them and so on because that's not respectful. We need to really get into that mindset of, uh, you know, thinking of these silent teachers and, and being respectful and so on. And I'm, you know, I don't tell my students don't go out and not celebrate Halloween and things like that. But, you know, while we're in here and while we're doing this, this is the, the mindset we want to engender. And I think that's important too, you know, getting back to my own family history. Uh, you know, my dad donated his body. My mom is not at all comfortable with that idea. She's not going to do that. And I'm not sure she was all that comfortable with my dad's decision to do that. But I know that if she would see a medical student or a nursing student, you know, in an anatomy lab um, with, you know, skeletal remains with a silly hat on it, she's going to think of dad and she's going to think of, you know, what happened to his body. And, I, you know, that's not the kind of message we want to be sending, right. um, not only to the families of the human donors, but for potential new donors. Like, you know, I might think well, I was going to do that, but if... If this is what happens in the lab at that school, I'm not donating my body there. Absolutely. You know, and I think you brought up cultural differences. And I think one thing that's interesting is, you know, you look at like uh, you mentioned Dia de Muertos and that's like an interesting cultural. It's like a celebration. It's a connection that um, the people of Spanish heritage have with their relatives and ancestors. And in the U.S., I think one of the things that makes some of the stuff that we do with bodies so odd is that when people die, we kind of immediately, we take the body away and it disappears and it doesn't come back until, um, sometimes it never comes back. Um, if people aren't viewed before cremation, for example, or, uh, you know, it doesn't come back until it's been prepared at a funeral home and it's, you know, so death is like this weird thing. And I find that a lot of times people will look at what, I do as an anatomist who does dissection of humans is this kind of weird thing. And it, you know, really isn't, I mean, it's just, it's, but it, as people kind of culturally view it differently um, is kind of some weird thing to them. So the more we can make it a real normal thing when we talk to people, but also kind of a serious thing, hold ourselves to like higher levels of ethics, higher, higher standards when we do that type of stuff. Sure. Well, you know, the the lab um, at your school, I've never actually been on your campus to see it, but I've seen pictures and I think even some videos when it was first built. I think Bill Parati was sharing some of those at, at HAPS, and I've seen presentations that you've done where you've shown us, you know, some parts of the lab. And, and there's kind of, I mean, you, you, you folks have been very conscious about this whole idea of respect for the human donors and, and even the design of the lab in that you're kind of entering a sacred space and even have some signage and so on that sort of prepares the student, you know, before their first visit on sort of the kind of thought processes and, you know, conscious framework, yeah. you know, ought to be developed before they go in. We're a, we're a pretty small community college, and we're in a pretty small city in uh, upstate New York. And so it's, not, it's no surprise that we have a donor lab on campus. Everyone knows about it. We, um, when we were able to design our lab, we got very, very lucky. We have two separate rooms. We actually have three separate rooms. We have an outer lab that students come into first, where we do our physiology or where we work with our skeletal remains. And then from there, you walk into our inner lab where the donor room is. And we have um, hospitals have donated us old surgical lights for overheads. We have a walk-in cooler for storage. And then we actually have a third kind of prep room behind that that we can store chemicals and store uh, materials in. But when students walk in from the hall, the first thing they're greeted by is a silent teacher's memorial plaque that was actually donated by one of our students a couple of years ago that we're lucky enough to have the names of all of our donors that we've ever had here. So that's kind of the first step that students have. And then as you walk from our outer lab into the actual donor room where we work with the donors, we have a couple of important signs. We have um, kind of a silent teacher's message and a, you know, from, from the dead, we teach the living. And that's kind of that respect step as we go into that space 
where, and, and this is another idea. I know I already mentioned Sabine Hildebrandt. Um, she, she liked this idea because in um, medical school, when they do gross anatomy, a lot of times they refer to the donor as first patient. And she actually thinks that that is, that increases the anxiety and stress for a medical student because patients are real and living and there are consequences to your decisions. She likes the idea of silent teacher because they're not able to talk to you, but what you do is you learn from the actual anatomical dissection. You learn from doing, uh, you know, a patient will come in and we have their death certificate and it says, you know, because of the way that a, a donor is prepared after they die, uh, for the preservation, uh, it has to person has to die in usually palliative care or in a hospital attended death. They had, the body has to be processed within a short period of time. So a lot of times you know, there can't be an autopsy. So there a lot of times death certificate says person died of cardiac arrest or person died of uh, respiratory arrest, and, and essentially that's the way everyone dies: is their heart stops or they stop breathing. But you know, sometimes we'll have some indication of, you know, they had these symptoms or they had this condition they were being treated for. But essentially what we get to do is go through and say, well, what can we see? What do we notice about this individual? What can this individual tell us? And I think that's an important idea in terms of, so, you know, part of it is respect. We respect them as a teacher, but part of it is they, they don't have a voice anymore. So what we, the best we can do is we can learn from what their anatomy shows us. And again, I think we're gifted to not, we don't use the anatomical models, which I don't think are bad, but they're almost perfect representations. They can be corrected. They can be fixed. They're color coded. And then when we go to our donors, you go in and you look and the stomach isn't blue and the liver isn't brown and the, um, well, I guess brown, that's a bad choice because the liver is kind of closer to brown, but you, you know, you get the idea that there's not exactly this perfect representation and we have to kind of know well where are we looking what type of thing should we be looking for oh this is very different than what we were expecting what might that mean you know so those are the types of things that we try to pick up on there's a surgical scar here where does that lead to you know so there's all of this teaching that those individuals are doing from us year to year that we are able to pass on to the students which is i think way more beneficial than um this, you know, just focusing on, you know, I, so we, we try to get our students, they're like, this doesn't look anything like the book. Yeah, of course it doesn't look yeah. like the book because the book is perfect. So, you know, it's, it's like this great teaching tool. And so, you know, it's, we're wonderful to have that opportunity. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I, I think it was the last time I heard you speak on this topic. I, I caught myself afterward a few times as I'm, um, doing my, uh, my exercise routines and so on. I'm thinking to myself, I, I have a body donor card in my pocket. I've made arrangements to donate my body to medical education. So, you know, after hearing you talk about this, I, I, I've caught myself thinking while I'm exercising, like I have to build up those muscles because, yeah. you know, muscles are hard to figure out in a cadaver that's not very, uh, you know, where the muscles are not very well developed. So I want to build them up because I want to yeah. be a good teacher. And, uh, you know, I, I, th I sometimes think about my own body like, well, you know, what are these students going to be seeing when I pass away? I need to take care of myself. Yeah, take care of yourself. Yeah. The, um, I, I went and visited uh, Mark Nielsen out in Utah last year and he has, they have a wonderful donation program out there, but it was probably one of the younger donors I'd ever seen. And I think he was like a 56 year old male, but when he passed away, he, his muscles were just in incredible shape. And so I was looking at this gentleman and I'm thinking to myself, wow, is th I've seen pictures, but is this really what this is supposed to look like? I mean, we you get used to looking at a lot of, uh, you know, elderly people who uh, a lot of times have been bedridden for a period of time and the muscles are difficult. So yeah, it's, it's interesting to see how things vary from person to person. Well, you know, I, I could talk about this kind of stuff all day, but we have limited time and um, that's it for now. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to have a second part and uh, Aaron has already mentioned, you know, he's done a lot of work looking into some of the Nazi anatomists and some of the ethical issues involved with that. And so that's what we're going to explore in the next episode. I hope you can tune in then. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. 
By the way, Aaron is available for speaking engagements anywhere, so feel free to contact him using the information in the show notes and at the episode page at theapprofessor.org. A searchable transcript and captions for the audiogram of this episode are funded by AAA, the American Association of Anatomists, at anatomy.org. Hey, I'm a member. Why don't you join, too? Regular listeners to this podcast know that I love to tell stories about the olden days. And, well, this being a podcast, there's there's nobody here to stop me, so I'm going to do it again. Way back in 1995, I was the conference director for the HAPS Annual Conference in St. Louis. And I had set up some little mini field trips within the workshop portion of the annual conference. And one of those was a field trip to the medical school at Washington University in St. Louis. They have a very widely known medical school there. And I had heard that there was an anatomical museum within the med school that was open to the public, but only by appointment. And I couldn't find anybody that had ever been to it. So I called up the med school and got a hold of the person in charge of it and found out that really what it was is a set of uh, exhibits that they had set up in their dissection lab. I said, well, can, can I have my colleagues come in small groups during our conference and take a look at what's going on? And they said, yeah, sure, we'd love to have them. And I said, well, is it okay if I come and check it out first myself? and kind of get a feel for what to expect in case I get questions. And they said, yeah, come on down. You know, when's a convenient time? And so I went down there and uh, met the person who was in charge of it. And he walked me down the hall and unlocked the door and let me in there and said, just, you know, whenever you're done, just close the door, make sure it locks behind you and uh, I'll see you around sometime. (laughs) And so I thought, well, okay. And so I walked in there and oh my gosh, it was amazing. But I'll never forget the first thing I saw. I just, I sort of turned away from the door and looked straight ahead. And there was a big shelving unit. And it's, you know, that old style museum shelving where it's a a glass enclosed case. But it was really big. And right there at eye level was what looked like two human torsos. At first, I thought it was a human torso model, like, like we have in our community college lab where it's uh, the legs are cut off and sometimes the head is removed, but you can see a little bit of what's left of the shoulder and then you see the torso and it's opened up and you can see the lungs and the heart and the abdominal organs and so on from a, a anterior perspective. And so that's what I thought I was looking at at first, but then I realized, well, this is like an old style model because it doesn't look all shiny and bright like the, the usual models. And then I realized, no, that's a museum jar that has an actual human torso in it that's been preserved and it's been prosected so I can see those organs like I would in a model. And what I thought was two big glass jars that contain two torsos, it turns out there was one torso and a mirror. And I thought, well, what's the point of this? And so I start looking more closely at it and considering it. You know, sort of like when you're at an art museum, you know, sometimes I'll glance at a piece of art and it won't really suck me in. But if I take a moment to look at a painting, it kind of draws you in and you start to see things you wouldn't, you would never have seen at just a glance. Well, that happened to me and I realized, oh my gosh, this is situs and versus. This person's organs are completely flipped around in a mirror image, and that's why they had a mirror set up. It was sort of, they were at an angle, almost a 90-degree angle. Well, actually, maybe it was exactly a 90-degree angle. I don't know. It was 1995. I can't be expected to remember every detail. But it was set up in a way that you could see, by looking in the mirror, you could see what would look like a normal arrangement of organs. And then when you look at the actual specimen, you could see everything was flip-flopped around, situs and versus. Clearly, that was a dramatic and enlightening moment for me because I still remember it from all the way back in 1995. And there were a lot of other very interesting specimens in there. You can imagine over the course of decades upon decades of work at WashU's medical school that they would have come across some very interesting variations in human anatomy, and they preserved some of those. 
This one happened to be from, the, um, I think, the, the last half of the 19th century, and it was still very well preserved. Now, in the preview uh, episode, prior to this full episode, we dissected the terms situs and versus and situs solitus and the related terms dextrocardia and levocardia. And we're going to get to those terms in a couple of minutes, and I'll explain them again very briefly. But I also want to bring up, before we do that, a recent news item about a 99-year-old woman from Oregon who donated her body for dissection. It ends up that she had situs inversus with levocardia, but she never knew it. Nobody, her doctors, nobody ever knew that she had it. It wasn't until they got it at the Oregon Health and Science University that they discovered this situation where she had reversed organs, except her heart was still facing toward the left. So it wasn't quite like that specimen I saw at WashU, but it was still a case of a variety of situs inversus. So those anatomy students at Oregon Health and Science University, they got to explore this very unusual variation in human anatomy. Some of you may have seen the poster about this case at the AAA meeting last month. Cam Walker and Mark Hankin had a poster called An Unusual Case of Situs Inversus with Levocardia. So what do we mean exactly when we say that this donor had situs inversus with levocardia? We've already mentioned that situs inversus is a variation of human anatomy where the viscera are flipped over into a mirror image of the typical arrangement of organs. What's usually on the left is now on the right, and what's typically on the right is now on the left. Oh, by the way, situs inversus is sometimes called situs transversus or situs oppositus. Whatever you call it, this condition is congenital meaning that it shows up during prenatal development, not something that happens later in life as a result of, oh, I don't know, doing too many spins on the dance floor. It's not that. It's not due to environmental influences like that. It's found in about one of every 10,000 people in the population. So it is rare. It's not super duper rare, but it's pretty darn rare. Most of those who have this variation have what's called Situs inversus totalis, meaning that one's entire set of visceral organs is flipped over left to right, or right to left, if you want to look at it that way. There's not any particular danger in having this variation. Well, except healthcare providers may get really confused when they're assessing your health, and we know that confusion among healthcare providers could lead to complications, could lead to maybe even some very serious complications. So there's, yeah, there's that downside. Now, going back to that young man with situs inversus at the Washu Med School from the latter half of the 19th century, when I, I read the information in the, the little exhibit there, I found out that he had died of complications of appendicitis. Remember, his appendix was on the wrong side at least compared to everybody else, his appendix was on the left, not on the right. I'm wondering if left-sided pain and tenderness didn't contribute to an initial misdiagnosis where somebody said, no, that can't be appendicitis, it's on the wrong side. Maybe that eh, could have ended up costing him his life. I mean, there's that somewhat well-known case of Donny Osmond, who was a, a popular singer and actor of my generation. He had appendicitis when he was 15. And it could have been treated before it got as serious as it did if anyone had known that he has situs inversus. As a matter of fact, he was, in fact, misdiagnosed early on in that episode, and it wasn't until it had progressed to a very serious stage that he got some treatment. But I guess having situs inversus could have some advantages. I don't know. I mean, there's probably advantages to anything, right? One of the villains in a James Bond novel claims to have survived an assassination attempt because he has situs inversus, and the assassin's bullet missed shooting him in the heart for that reason. Now, I don't know. That's pretty far-fetched, as is just about everything in a James Bond novel. But I don't know, Meg, you know, I guess could happen. So let's look at the heart when one has situs inversus. 
First of all, the heart, like many of our organs, is chiral. Chirality literally means handedness, which I mentioned way back in episode 30, where I discussed the chirality of cells. Put another way, organs such as the heart do not have the same structure when you flip them around. It's like your two hands. They're not interchangeable because they're flipped over versions of each other. In situs and versus totalis, that would include having the heart flipped over so that the apex is pointing toward the right, not the left. Ordinarily, in most of us, about two-thirds of the heart is to the left of the body's median, that is, to the left of a mid-sagittal plane. But when it's flipped over, the heart is mostly on the right. This situation is called dextrocardia, meaning heart toward the right. I suspect that the dextrocardia often seen in situs and versus does not really decrease your chances of being assassinated. I'm just saying. But I'm not an expert in assassinations, so we'll just have to leave it there. But sometimes situs and versus occurs where the heart doesn't flip over. It still points toward the left, as it does in most of us. When one has a left-pointing heart, it's called levocardia. That's what I have. I know, because I've seen medical images of my heart, and it's pointing to the left, just like I expected. That's probably what you have, too. Probably. I mean, it's what 99.999% of us have. By the way, I sometimes make use of this fact, that I have levocardia. I have a left-pointing heart. For example, if someone asks me to do something I really don't want to do, I may say to them, I'd love to help you move all your furniture up to the fourth floor, but, oh, I'm sorry, I have levocardia. <laughs> okay, that doesn't usually work, but I, I have tried such things. About 1 in 22,000 people have situs and versus with levocardia. So that's a little bit more than twice as rare as plain old ordinary situs and versus totalis. Having situs and versus with levocardia is a weirder situation than regular situs and versus because here you have everything but one organ, a complex vital organ, flipped over. I don't know, sort of like having a left hand on a right forearm. Things aren't going to work as expected, I would think. In some cases, the crossing over of the aorta and pulmonary trunk and perhaps some other structures gets so messed up, it can make one more vulnerable to cardiac problems. But, as in the case of that 99-year-old body donor in Oregon, it doesn't have to cause any problems at all. Heck, maybe that's what made her live so long. By the way, there is another even rarer situation called situs ambiguous. It's also called heterotaxy. That's where things are not a neat mirror image of the typical layout of organs. The liver may be on the midline, the gut may be oddly rotated from its normal position. All kinds of things could be messed up. As you can imagine, situs ambiguous, depending on exactly what's out of place and how different from normal it is, is more likely to put a person at risk for medical complications. Situs ambiguous is, by the way, a lot more rare than situs inversus, which is already pretty rare. Now, you've probably been thinking, what causes situs inversus? It happens when a mother looks into a mirror during pregnancy. <laughs> no, 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 no. We'd all have situs inversus if that were true. It's when she breaks a mirror during pregnancy. Unless she throws salt over her shoulder. Okay, okay. None of that is true. I think there are still some unanswered questions about how situs and versus develops. But the last best story states that it's usually in the genes. It's considered to be an autosomal recessive condition in which both parents have to be carriers of an altered gene that results in situs and versus. But, in some cases, it seems to be X-linked, not autosomal. But either of these patterns of inheritance helps explain 
why it's so rare. But the next question is, at least the next question that occurs to me is, what is that altered gene doing? Or what is it supposed to be doing that it's not doing? From what I can tell, we can't really say for sure. Probably it's any of several different genes that are involved. So there are likely several different mechanisms that could be at play. One mechanism likely involved in at least some cases is primary ciliary dyskinesia, sometimes called PCD, primary ciliary dyskinesia. During embryological development, the normal functioning of the primary cilia of cells is necessary for normal positioning of internal organs. About half of embryos with PCD develop situs inversus. Individuals that have PCD account for about a quarter of all the cases of situs inversus. So it does seem clear that PCD is not the sole cause of situs inversus, but maybe eh, maybe the primary cilia are somehow always involved. Or maybe a lot of times they're involved, even if it's not full-blown PCD. Or maybe there are other things affecting positioning during organ development that cause situs inversus. Anyway, summing up, situs inversus, a really interesting, dramatic, fun kind of variation to look at, even though it's very rare. Distribution of this podcast is sponsored by the Master of Science in Human Anatomy and Physiology Instruction, the Happy Degree. Looking to power up your game in teaching A&P? Well, check out this online graduate program at nycc.edu slash happy. That's H-A-P-I. Or click the link in the show notes or episode page. As I mentioned earlier, I have three book recommendations from the AMP Professor Book Club to revisit. The first one is The Anatomist by Bill Hayes. The classic medical text, known as Gray's Anatomy, is one of the most famous books ever created, and it's well known to most AMP teachers. In this work of creative nonfiction, Bill Hayes uncovers the extraordinary lives of the Gray's Anatomy author and illustrator while providing a scalpel's eye view into the ingenuity of the human body. It's a story that many A&P teachers will enjoy, and will probably deepen their appreciation of anatomical illustration in general. It certainly will give context and background that can be shared with A&P students. I was most fascinated with the story of Henry Van Dyke Carter, the illustrator of Gray's Anatomy. That story gave me even greater appreciation of the amazing quality and accuracy of the images in the original book. This book has been around for a while, a long while, (laughs) but it's a timeless story that doesn't lose its value. Aaron Fried brought this up in his conversation with me, replayed in this episode, in which he discusses the book in the context of human body donors and anatomical illustrations made from human specimens. Check it out in the A&P Professor Book Club. That's at approfessor.org slash book club. By the way, related to the topic of human body donation, I want to mention a book I've been reading and which I highly recommend. It's called The Silent Teacher, The Gift of Body Donation. It's written by Dr. Claire Smith, who is head of anatomy at Brighton and Sussex Medical School in the United Kingdom. The title of her book incorporates the term silent teacher, which was how we referred to human body donors in episode 29. This term stresses the humanity of the donor and the critical role that donor plays in society. And that's the core message of this book, I think that critical role of our silent teachers in teaching health professionals, which in turn translates into assisting in the health and wellness of countless millions of us who benefit from healthcare strategies. As I'm reading the book, I was thinking that because I've had family members who became body donors, 
and both my wife and I have made arrangements to do that ourselves, this would be a great book to help other family members understand our decision and not only accept it, but embrace it. But as I continue to read the book, I'm also thinking this would be great for AMP professors to read too. For those of us who don't do human dissection in our program, it's a good background so that we can accurately explain the process to our students. For those of us who do use human body donors, this book will help us understand the perspectives of the different stakeholders involved so that we can effectively explain what we do with our students, our colleagues, and the community at large. But that gets me to thinking that this book would be great for our students, too. It will help prepare students as they get ready to have their first experience with a human body donor. But even students who don't have that opportunity will see how human science works, why human body donors are important, what actually goes on in anatomy, and perhaps even become interested in anatomy as a career or even becoming a body donor themselves. You probably didn't even know that the A&P Professor Book Club even exists, but it does, and this book is definitely on the recommended list. Check out the links in the show notes or go to the APProfessor.org and find Book Club in the menu. I have a book recommendation for you from the A&P Professor Book Club. This one is called Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers, written by Mary Roach. This was brought to mind recently by a tweet from my friend Krista Rumpolsky, and she was tweeting about the possibility of using it in an assignment for her A&P students, and she wanted to get some input and discussion around that. And this book has been around for a while, about 15 years. And until Krista mentioned it, I had kind of forgotten about it. Well, except when I remember it at odd times and places (laughs) that I'll tell you about in just a minute. It turns out that I have used this as an assigned reading for undergraduate A&P students, and they loved it. What I did was I asked them to read it and then write a couple of pages about what in the book struck them the most. What was particularly interesting to me is that their picks of what struck them the most ranged all over the place. And it turns out they loved it. They loved, loved, loved this book. That's three loves. (laughs) They were as surprised as I was that an assigned reading would be so well loved. Now, when you take a look at this book, you'll see that it starts out with a description of Mary Roach, the author, going into this medical school lab where they had a bunch of heads of cadavers set up so that some surgeons could practice some brain surgery. And then it goes on and talks about the history of dissection. And she brings up the whole process of decay and more than you ever wanted to know about how all that works. Um, She talks about how bodies are used for research and all kinds of research. I mean, taking us way beyond what we might expect. And there's various aspects of how a body might be handled for funerals. She discusses what exactly is the point of death? At what moment are we dead? And all of the problems and issues surrounding that question. And, well, there's just all kinds of interesting stories and useful information in the book. Now, one of the things I like about Mary Roach's books, and I've read several of them, relates to today's featured Word of the Day on Dictionary.com, at least for the day that I'm recording this. The Word of the Day is expatiate, which means to move or wander about intellectually or imaginatively without restraint. That's kind of how she writes. That's kind of how I think. That's how my podcasts go, isn't it? Where I just kind of bounce around from one idea to another. So no wonder I like Mary Roach's writing, because she kind of writes like I think, 
kind of all over the place, just wandering here and there. Now, I'm thinking that 15 years after I read the book, I probably ought to read this book again. So I'm going to do that. It's on my list. But there are bits of information that have stuck with me over those 15 years, and they still pop into my head from time to time, sometimes kind of unexpectedly. For example, sometimes when I put in my rigid contact lenses, it pops into my head. I think about how she described these little plastic discs, sort of like rigid contact lenses, but with little spikes in them that funeral directors use to keep the eyelids closed. Now, what a thought to pop into your head in the morning as you're you're getting ready for the day and putting your contacts in, but, well, it happens. That's how my brain works. Sorry. And sometimes when I'm doing my slow cadence resistance training at the gym, it'll pop into my head about how I need to keep my muscles reasonably well-defined in my old age so that they'll be useful when I'm dissected later, something I've already arranged for. Now, Mary Roach's books in general, and this one in particular, is both informative and hilarious. And for me, that's all I need and want in a nonfiction book. So, in the AP Professor Book Club, I'm recommending Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers, and the author is Mary Roach, R-O-A-C-H. The A&P Professor Podcast has been entered into the People's Choice Podcast Awards, but I need a lot of nominations from listeners to get this podcast into the final slate of nominees. It only takes a minute or two to nominate, and it must be done by the last day in July. Just go to podcastawards.com and nominate the A&P Professor. That's it. I'm in the education category. You'll also have the opportunity to opt into the pool of judges if that's something that you might be interested in. That's podcastawards.com, or just click the link in the show notes or episode page before the end of July. I really do appreciate your help with this. The featured segment of this episode is the second of two chats I had with my friend Aaron Freit. Aaron is an assistant professor of anatomy and physiology at Mohawk Valley Community College in upstate New York. Besides a lot of experience teaching AMP, instructional design, and teaching methods, Aaron is dedicated to the use of human donor dissection and human and animal tissues for learning and instruction, and is a national speaker on the history of body donation, specializing in the history of body use in Nazi Germany. In episode 29, we talked about some issues surrounding human body donors, which Aaron likes to call silent teachers. In this episode, we talk about what he's learned about some of the Nazi anatomists and how that directly impacts A&P teachers today. Well, we're here once again with Aaron Fried, who's um, been talking to us in the previous episode about... uh, the attitudes that we have in using human donors. And we learned about why he doesn't like to use the term cadaver and some of the various issues of having respect for the human people, the real human people who have uh, donated their remains so that we can use it for anatomy education. And even in derivative ways, such as in various replicas and models and even the drawings that we see in anatomy atlases. and. Um, Aaron, I know you've done a lot of research on a series of anatomical drawings done by Edward Pernkoff and some of his colleagues, and they're still found in anatomy atlases today. So what's the story behind those illustrations, and why is that story important for A&P teachers like me to understand? Kevin, that's a, you've opened Pandora's box because... <laughs> Once you ask me questions like this, sometimes it's hard to get me to stop talking. But <laughs> Well, I, I have the recording switch at my end. so <laughs> Yeah, right. You cut me off if you need to. <laughs> okay. the, um, so before I talk about Pernkoff, I think kind of a, a generic intro to this is uh, I've been lucky enough to work with human donors for a long period of time. 
And I think part of studying Nazi anatomists is why I prefer the, the term human donor. Um, we use that here at Mohawk Valley Community College because we're really trying to emphasize a choice, a decision that individuals made. And I think probably six or seven or eight years ago when I started studying the Nazi anatomists, um, I read an article um, at the time. Uh, it's an Emily Bazelon article that was written. It was an online um, magazine. It was about a Senator Todd Aiken who made a claim about rape where an individual, a women who are legitimately raped have a, have a mechanism to shut that down. And the interesting part of the article to me, other than that absolutely not being true, is that that research actually comes from um, a kind of handed down set of citations from a Nazi anatomist named Hanuman Steve, who during World War II under Nazi power was doing research on the female menstrual cycle. And what, I mean, essentially what he was able to gain access to during that time was he was able to gain access to these individuals who were being executed by the Nazis. And he was able to gain these fresh tissues. The problem, if you have any experience with human donors, uh, the problem is that the type, the age of, of donation is usually uh, very um, much in the top, top ages for humans. I mean, I, in our lab right now, we have a 96 year old female donor and we have a 89 year old female donor. And so if we want to study kind of normal reproductive age, reproductive systems, you, you don't get to see that. As an interesting aside to that story, I had expected that I was going to go into the studying the Nazis and, and find out all sorts of information about uh, horrible things that were happening in concentration camps. But what I found out is that picture that these Nazi anatomists are working under kind of a eugenics model. And so the people in the concentration camps are essentially lesser humans. They're not the they're not the. Um, most powerful traits in the population. And so they wouldn't have used them for, for study. So these were actually executed German citizens. Uh, the women that Hermann Steve was using were uh, executed mainly for political dissidents. So essentially they had political views that were the opposite of the Nazi Reich and they were uh, executed because of those beliefs and anatomists found great benefit from being able to, to get those tissues and use those tissues for study. Um, I think to get back to Pernkoff, um, Pernkoff's a slightly different story because Pernkoff is in Vienna. So that's Austria. And kind of after World War I, Austria is you know, separated from the Germanic Empire. Um, Still a lot of the same conditions in Germany, still fairly fascist uh, regime, regime before World War II. In around 1936 or 37, uh, Hitler annexes Austria, and he says it's part of the German Reich again. At that time, um, Pernkoff, Edward Pernkoff becomes the dean of the medical school. Uh, un, uh, not unlike a lot of other places in um, Germany at the time, a lot of progressive faculty are kicked out. And I think at the University of Vienna, that was upwards of like 70% of the faculty is kicked out um, just because they're Jewish or sympathizers or uh, just dissenters in general. And so it creates this real kind of center of eugenic studies. And, it put, you know, Pernkoff kind of at the top as the dean uh, is in charge of, um, you know, acquiring bodies for the medical school. and at the same time is also starting to put together a, a plan to create several atlases. And the original plan was, um, it was very, it was, a, it was a big plan. They ended up publishing before he died, I think seven volumes of the atlas um, that were each, each volume was revised over time and they were very detailed drawings. I think one of the things that makes the books unique is that um, they brought in artists who were watercolor painters, but instead of just looking at dissected specimens, they worked with Pernkoff, who was an excellent dissector. And so they understood the anatomy. 
and they were able to very accurately capture three-dimensional um, characteristics in their two-dimensional paintings. And the one thing that Pernkoff really wanted away from normal is he, he urged the painters to use very vivid color. So these paintings are described as being very artistic. Uh, in fact, one of, the th one of the reasons the atlases are sought after today is because people view them as kind of these controversial works of art. So where the book starts to become controversial is that during the war, just like Hermann Steve, Pernkoff is uh, able to gain access to a uh, supply of people who were executed as prisoners of the German Reich. And again, a lot of these people were not, these were not capital murderers. These were individuals who just disagreed with the Reich and were executed for their beliefs and ended up being dissected at the University of Vienna. These atlases, so after Pernkoff dies, somewhere around the 1960s is when um, the publisher has some of uh, Pernkoff's colleagues edit the books and probably much to Pernkoff's dismay, they took out pages and pages of his text and all that remained in the final publications were his artist's work. They whittled it down to two volumes that were published three times in English, but they were published in, uh, in addition to German and English, they were published in Japanese, they were published in French, Spanish, they were published in Italian. Um, they were published as um, inserts for medications. They were actually using these to sell pharmaceuticals to people in different languages um, as kind of like a professional development opportunity for uh, physicians. And one of the things that people noticed is that the artists did things like sign these paintings with, it, it was common for people to sign the paintings in their artwork, but they were putting swastikas in their signatures or they were putting the SS lightning bolts in their signatures. And it really wasn't until the 1990s. So the first uh, edition of Pernkoff was published in 1938, 1939. First time anyone ever really started to raise kind of big questions was around the late 1980s, early 1990s. And uh, it wasn't until then that people started to look into what was going on with these books. Wow. Yeah. You know, I have um, a couple of books where there are some of those in there. And, uh, and this is something that, you know, I've talked about to my students before. At the beginning of Anatomy and Physiology, uh, I have a little kind of an intro uh, discussion of how we know what we know in anatomy and physiology. And with the anatomy, you know, clearly it's dissection. That's the root of all, all that we know. And, but I talk about how, you know, the, the history, the, um, you know, the culture, the social setting of any one time sort of determines what kind of experimentation we do. And and that operates today. There's all kinds of questions being raised in our society about what is appropriate or not appropriate to do in terms of, of uh, research and education and so on. And we touched on some of that in uh, the previous episode when we had our earlier discussion. But I, I did bring up this sort of thing like, okay, there are known cases where there's, there are you know, obvious ethical questions about how this material was produced, and yet it's still in our material. It's you know, here's an atlas that has some of them in it. So my question for you, Aaron, is, you know, do you use those atlases in your own teaching? Should we be using them in our own teaching? What's, what's a good way to think about that given their history? Yeah, so that's, a, that's an interesting question. I think one of the things that brought me into studying Pernkoff in particular, and I think I've been hyper-focused on Pernkoff for probably the last year, um, the uh, problem came up uh, as I, so as I'm studying six or seven years ago, I'm thinking about the, these Nazi anatomists and I'm reading and I'm reading about this Pernkoff Atlas controversy. And I come across this one reference that says, oh, hey, by the way, these Pernkoff images are also in an atlas in, that was published in the U.S. by Carmine Clemente. And I'm like, wait, what? That's we have that in our lab. I've been, the, you know talking about these Nazis for two years, we have these in our lab. And I went into the lab the next morning and I went, 
started flipping through the book and I was like, oh, that is totally one of the images, one of the author's signatures. And right there in one of the editions of the Clementi Atlas was the signature where one of the swastikas had been erased. Um, So it had been doctored so that it didn't look like that was an issue. So I spent a lot of time digging into to Pernikoff within the last year. So I want to say last fall, I was invited by um, our colleague, Mark Nielsen, who has a great dissection program out at the University of Utah, to give my Nazi anatomy talk. And I mentioned, oh, Carmine Clementi, you know, these images are in his book. By the way, um, the, there's a whole series of atlases by another German anatomist, um, Sabata, who the same art has been pulled into those books. Someone sent me an image from one of the most recent um, versions of Gray's Anatomy, where one of the images is in there from one of those artists. I mean, these these uh, images kind of have worked their way into a series of different books. So as I'm talking about Pernkoff and the connection to Clementi and that it's in our lab, one of Mark's students raises his hands and he says, well, what do you do about those atlases? And I kind of took a deep gulp and I said, you know, I've had these atlases in, in our lab for the last seven years and I, I, I don't know. I don't know what we should do about them. It's a very difficult to me uh, decision. I'm, you know, first off, I'm not an ethicist. I'm an anatomist. I think of ethical questions all the time. But, you know, so how, you know, how do I solve this, this uh, problem? Um, I spent probably the first couple of months making appointments and going to, it was uh, kind of my tour of uh, Ivy League schools near me. I went to uh, Yale and I saw some of the uh, original editions. I went to, um, I've been to Harvard, been to Johns Hopkins, like just trying to like look at what these books looked like, see if there's any clues in there, reading everything I could. And, uh, you know, so I actually ended up, I have a collection of the Pernkoff atlases in my office. We still use the um, Clementi atlases. Around the same time, though, I uh, read some work by a woman, Sabine Hildebrandt, who she's an anatomy professor. She actually became an MD in Germany. She taught in Michigan for a while and now is at Harvard. She has a big uh, emphasis studying these Nazi anatomists. And it just, you know, one day out of the blue, sent her an email and said, I, can I come and talk to you about this? I have some questions that you might be able to answer or at least point me in the right direction. And she said she would absolutely love to talk to me, but said, you need to look this over. She had been working with ethicists and rabbis and, and clergy to try and figure out, um, you know, is it uh, possible that we can figure out what to do with, um, I think the big problem that they started with was, you know, they're trying to figure out what can we do with these books or, you know, they over in um, Germany, for example, they, if they're digging for anything new, they come across these graves. What do we do with these discovered remains? So there's this very specific um, protocol they developed called the Vienna Protocol. And in there, there's a, a recommendation about Pernkoff and it's long and it, you know, it kind of goes on to say, uh, well, the people probably wouldn't have consented to display of their body. Um, but in this case, because things have already been done and, you know, kind of goes on to say, if you use this with people who are going to use their training to do better in the world, and if you use the um, idea of exposing what Pernkoff did, and using that as a way to talk about ethics and how not just being a good being a good um, medical professional doesn't just mean um, doing good um, work, at, you know, in your profession, but also making good ethical choices. That you know, there's a route, there's a path to using these materials as long as you acknowledge. And so, what we've done is we had a big ceremony last semester where we did a talk on campus about Pernkoff. We created a plaque that acknowledges that we're not getting rid of um, the materials because getting rid of the materials is something that the Nazis stood for and we don't stand for that censorship. And so essentially, um, we acknowledge and we try, we have, a, we have a plaque outside of our donor lab that says on the way in, we acknowledge that this has happened. We can't undo it. 
the best thing we can do is kind of learn from it and going forward, uh, make our promise to do as good as we can going forward. So, you know, we, we use the materials, but we try to acknowledge what they are and, you know, work with them. You know, I, I wonder if by acknowledging that and making people aware of, it doesn't make them, you know, more informed that things like this have happened in the history of the world and, you know, maybe can sort of stand as a, a warning to not let it happen again. I know, uh, you know, I have those thoughts uh, when, um, you know, when I think about the history of these things is that, that, that it's important to know about them um, so that we don't repeat that again. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's not, my guess is it's not the last time it's going to happen. I mean, even if you look at the story of Henrietta Lacks, I mean, that's a very much more contemporary example of uh, a woman who her cells were harvested. Um, she thought for just a, a routine medical procedure, but they were kept alive. And people, you know, not only did they end up coming up with good tr medical treatments, but people made money off of that. And, you know, it, there's kind of this conscious effort that I think, especially as anatomists, we have to make to um, do better than maybe a normal person would. I, um, I have lots of friends who are academics and I talk to them about this and they, you know, people, people will say to me, well, you know, this, these, these people are already dead. You know, I doesn't maybe necessarily, necessarily, um, doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't use them. I mean, they're already there. And I say, we owe a better debt to the people who make conscious donation that we understand and recognize that we have to be better. So. That, that's a great point. Um, you know, Aaron, I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. It's, it, you know, it's a fascinating story uh, with these illustrations and the history behind them. And I think, it brings up some important points and I really appreciate you sharing your perspective on those. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Kevin. I'll make sure that um, I get you the link to my website and I'll put some materials up. I know it's tough to talk about visual stuff and not be able to right. like, actually point to them, but I'll, I'll get some of that stuff up there so that if your li listeners are interested, uh, they can see some of the stuff we're talking about, but especially the plaque. I think that's uh, kind of an important uh, message. So, yeah, I'm, I'm always interested to talk about this stuff. So, Okay, great. Well, I've already talked to Aaron before we chatted today about him coming on the podcast again in the near future. So, so look forward to that. And, uh, and I will have a link to Aaron's website in the show notes for the podcast and also on the episode page at the APProfessor.org. But in the meantime, go ahead and give us a call at 1-833-LION-DEN, that's L-I-O-N-D-E-N, or 1-833-546-6336, or send an email at podcast at the APProfessor.org, and uh, give us your reaction to um, what Aaron's been talking about, or maybe share some additional information or perspectives or resources that we can link to. Um, Aaron, again, thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Kevin. I have some links to Aaron's website and Instagram in the show notes and at the episode page at theapprofessor.org. Aaron is available for speaking engagements anywhere, so feel free to contact him using that information. Well, I hope you enjoyed exploring some of the issues and controversies concerning the use of human remains including reproductions, in the teaching of human anatomy. This was a special episode featuring related clips from the podcast archive. A regular lineup of new preview episodes and full episodes will resume again in a few weeks. Hey, don't forget that I always put links in the show notes and at the episode page at theapprofessor.org in case you want to further explore any ideas mentioned in this podcast or if you want to visit our sponsors, which I'd love to see you do. There are many ways to stay connected to this podcast and get new episodes as soon as they're released. Just go to the approfessor.org slash listen to explore the many ways you can do this. 
And I want to remind you that if you phone in or send in a recording of your suggestion for the AMP Professor Book Club, I'll send you a $25 Amazon gift certificate. And if you are among the first five contributors in this promotion, you'll be put into a drawing for a free Amazon Kindle Fire HD10 tablet. As of the moment of this recording, there's still room in that first five list. Or you're welcome to call in with your questions, comments, and ideas anytime at the podcast hotline. That's 1-833-LION-DEN. That's 1-833-546-6336. Or send a recording or written message to podcast at theapprofessor.org. And you can follow this podcast in Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram using the handle at the AP Professor. I'll see you down the road. The AP Professor is hosted by Kevin Patton, professor, blogger, and textbook author in human anatomy and physiology. This podcast is not to be used as a personal flotation device.